this is the freaking, this is where it, all the meat is at. Like, this is, this is it, dude. Like, <laughs> I was waiting for this, and I got it, and it was absolutely worth waiting for. You, it was a feast. It, I, it's such a feast, <laughs> this whole sequence. So I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about it. <laughs> What's up? Welcome back to the State of the Ark podcast. My name is Mike. My name's Kason. Let's get into the f- remainder of the Encephalon dive sequence that we left off on last time. Yes. Already, oh, I have boy. one note that I neglected to bring up from oh, the from last, last episode, but yeah, it it's up. a brief one. So when Nephilim disappears in the park, she disappears in a magic that looks exactly the same as what Junior does when he does his oh, little Oh, really? It's that reddish glow with those little particles that show up and around. Oh, okay. It uh, just looks like Junior's magic. That's all I'm saying. I don't okay. know what that means. I really don't. We'll see. But Hopefully, it was worthy point. of a note. <laughs> okay, okay, so... Oh, we were talking about that rabbit last time. That's where we left off. The freaking rabbit. And there was uh, there was a note from Shion about this rabbit. She says, I've always liked this character since I was little. At mm. first glance, it looks very cute, yes. but there's something more to its allure uh, than that. Yes. <laughs> For sure. Right. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I think that was the last thing I forgot to mention. Okay, last cool, time. cool. I think we can move on back. The, the to place Junior. is just—it's just really, really creepy. Yes, like they did a great job of making it just feel so creepy for sure. But yeah. Uh, back so to the Junior. next time we catch up with Junior and crew, they've come to the UTIC organization's central tower. This part is. This is why I told you guys yeah. to read Book of Revelation chapter 20, right? Yes, here. yes. The guy's um, quoting it. Yeah. Standing it, atop the so, tower. Uh, Mumo Ooh. asks. Labyrinthos. Labyrinthos, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I thought was a really strange, specific term to try and use to it, ask what this place is. <laughs> it was. And I, um, I mean, labyrinth, I was like, is labyrinthos a reference to something? It's just Greek. It means labyrinth, right? Yeah, so right. yes, it's a reference to the Greek labyrinth, which is the Minotaur and uh, what's his name? Um, oh, shoot. Th- Theseus, the slayer yeah. of the Minotaur. Um, it's a reference to that in general, but... yeah. Other than that, you know, it's nothing, nothing too crazy. Um, oh, we have, uh, okay. Now this, th- remember last time I was talking about the U uh, hyphen thing, like with U tick or yeah. U do yeah. being a thing. Aiden's telling me uh, from, from Discord, a, a pa- we have a Patreon Discord where only our $10 patrons can access yes. and they watch this live just so people know where we're getting this from. It could be you. Aiden says the bunny's name is you, Kuhn. In Japanese. Kun. In Japanese. Okay. So, Yukun. That's crazy because um, when we talk about the letter U, the bunny represents the Unus Mundus network. Right. Right. Yes. The UMN. It's like the mascot character for that. Yes. Yeah. But the UMN. I'm just U-M-N, saying. UMN. So, and U-Doo, his name. So, U-Tick. Now, I thought that the Yukun or Ukun, whatever, I thought that that was a reference to the Unus Mundus network because. And they just take the first U and just say, oh, it's Yukun. It's you, it's Yuchan or whatever. It's a, f- a cute little U. Right. I thought it was referencing the Unus Mundus that network. And it may still be, but that's crazy that it also might reference Utik. That's wild. Or Udu did no- or whatever or Udu, Udu is. Yeah. I would not. I did not make that connection. That's great. The U, I'm telling you, the U means something. It does. And UMN. I mean, it all might yeah. be centered in that in the UMN. In yeah. fact, this bunny might be the lead antagonist <laughs> of the <laughs> of whole the freaking game. game. <laughs> okay, so back to uh, Momo and Junior. Yes. So she asks Labyrinthos. I'm, I'm guessing she's asking whether where they're at is called Labyrinthos. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but we have a, a man standing at the top of this giant tower and basically quoting Revelation. Yes. Um, Hallelujah, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and yep. death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. This is the second coming of Christ. Yeah, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Rejoice, all ye. The time for feasting has come. This is Revelation chapter 20, verses 13 through 16. Great. It's the final judgment, and it comes, I believe, right after the Michael slays the dragon. Right. Right? Maybe something like that. Uh, Or maybe that that happens one verse or one chapter later. But yeah, this is when... This is the second coming and the final judgment, right? Yes. So judgment, I don't know. It's almost as if that's what's being inflicted on Milcha right now is a judgment, right? They're being judged right. and found lacking, except for the few 
who are special yes, and right. they get to ascend yes. with God. So that's crazy. Also, I'm um, seeing Milsha uh, playing it uh, through juniors. And um, I also see that his dream, when he had that crazy dream, um, that that was in Milsha. And that's something yes. I didn't connect earlier, but at least in part as, um, as junior is walking through the dream and you see that crazy rainbow, like fire, like behind him that right. looks like the Ouroboros, um, that that's, you're seeing that here too. So whatever's going on in Milsha, it, it involves that rainbow like energy that's just like beaming out everywhere. Right. So it's revealed in the scene that this person shouting this is yeah. Yoki Misrahi. Yes. And he gets he, jacked. It just this explosion blows up and kills him. <laughs> However, this is part of the story because elsewhere, I can't remember if you read this in the book of Revelation or not. Uh, it's in the same exact chapter that references the martyrs for Christ. Yes, right. And it says that the martyrs, those who were killed and beheaded for Christ, will rise up from the dead in the first resurrection and, and reign with Christ over the earth. Yeah. And then he dies. Right. He, 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 it's, it's almost as if he dies as a martyr for his cause right. and, and, you know, is now seated with Christ. Anyways, right. it's, uh, it's crazy. Yeah, it's just he, fascinating. He falls I love from it. that it's tower. Fascinating. He falls all the way down. Yep. Momo is freaking out, of course. She, she had, I think she had been trying to run to him, like calling up. Yeah, she was going to catch this, him. Yeah. yeah. And they were kind of trying to hold her back. They're like, Don't, yeah, that's right. not your dad. Yeah, or right. Your dad isn't who you think he is, right? But she, right. she tries to catch him and he just disappears. And then they all kind of start falling. Yes, the, like, the it's whole like the, world the whole disappears. The floor and the world around them yeah. sort of dissolves, and, and they then start you get to that fall. rainbow energy stuff that that yeah. um, that Junior had fallen into earlier in his right. dream. You you get right. that again, and of um, course, dreams are as you mentioned in the last episode are in, inherently connected to the collective unconscious. Right. Yes. So there's a reason why they'd be connected. Right. And then um, there's sort of a, so, like some sort of summon circle that opens up yeah. above them. Yep, yep. The screen sort of fades to white, and and that kind of ends that. Now, yeah. we 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 summarized this scene very quickly, but I don't <laughs> I don't want to um, I don't want to like <laughs> I guess um, undervalue the impact of it. <laughs> yes, it was like crazy. This scene wild. is is really intense. It's it's yeah. packed sort of with like a deeper meaning that of course we talked about the, the book of revelation tie yeah, and, yeah. and, and the, the martyr for Christ thing and yes. what that could mean about Ascension. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of that we have to kind of wait, I think to really comment on until we find out sort of like what happened like the res the full resolution or the yeah. full sequence of events of what happened here. Right. I, we're not going to be able to make perfect sense of it for a little while. Yeah. But it is worth noting that he falls and disappears into Momo's arms, right? Yes. Now, whether he would have fallen and disappeared regardless or whether there's some symbolism in the fact that he, his body, disappears inside of Momo's body. Yeah. Uh, we already know that there's some truth to that. Yes, right? yes, exactly. That somehow he's inside of her body, right? Yeah, I but, think that's a great point. Yeah, and so also the idea of living on, right, of being immortal, right? He yes. is alive within her. Yes. So. Yeah, all of his research, basically everything that made him famous or, or yeah. what he was known for is stored inside of Momo. It's stored so his inside disappearing her. in her arms. Yeah is can be seen i think symbolically yes. as that oh. sort of concept he's he he's yeah. like dissolved into her she is him in yes her. they're the same it's almost it's almost a type of theosis except that's like a god thing this is more just a enmeshment of two people but yeah. it's worth noting too that uh, momo only has good memories of her father yes she, but this is an key, idea key part the, there it, because very much you, so you're, you you are not your full self if you only hold on to the joyous you must also face the parts you don't want to. Now, yes. we're not seeing any of Momo's memories necessarily. In, mm. It's mostly Junior's and, and right. Shion's. But this is key because we've talked about how it seems Junior and Gaignan think that Momo's idea of Yoki Mizrahi is not complete at the very least, if right. not also just totally false. Or just planted, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she's going to have to face the hard reality, which she has already shown a resistance to, Yeah, yeah. that is my father a bad person? Was right. he a bad person? Does that mean I'm bad because a bad person made me? Mm. These are things she's been trying to hide from and not really yep. wanting to know the answers to because she's afraid. Yeah, she, th This character is also going to have to go through the alchemical process that 
the rest of them. I think all the characters in this game are going to have to. Alan, maybe. I mean, we even have Ziggy, who is running. He doesn't want to remember his past either. Oh, exactly. He's probably the worst case of this. Yes. Like, he's like asking for brain surgery to just forget his traumatic past. He doesn't want to remember his previous lives. He wants to be full machine. Yes. He doesn't want his humanity anymore. He's running away from that. All the characters in this game are going to have to go through the same process of facing their past you know what's great though i just love this so so dr mizrahi exists within momo right he falls he dies and his body falls inside of her and she you know takes only the good parts it's yes. almost as if she renders a judgment on him and she accepts the her sinless father right mm-hmm. that all of all of his evil deeds were washed away yeah. and that only his good nature enters into her heart and that she catches him, um, but only the goodness of him and that she, she will remember them no more, right? The idea right. that those sins are gone. They're not a part of you anymore. And um, it, it, whether he designed this or not, it's, it's just beautiful symbolically. It's just so cool. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, I, I kind of mentioned this last time, but it, it like playing through this sequence, I, I just was, th- this was it. Like, it's this powerful. was it. I it was, was really waiting powerful. the whole time <laughs> for, for this. this. <laughs> like, this is why I play Xeno games. Yeah, this yes, sequence, yes. this whole encephalon dive. Yeah. Um, more of this, please. <laughs> please. But can you imagine a whole in, game of this? JRPGs, generally speaking. Yes, more please. of this, please. Yes. Like, not, uh, well, I won't go on that freaking tangent right now. <laughs> <laughs> About my misgivings of more recent anime and JRPGs. Gotcha, and, gotcha. And, like the way they present the stories. Yeah. Uh, 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 and, and maybe even my misgivings of, say, Xenoblade 2. Um, this is the freaking, this is where it, all the meat is at. Like, this is, this is it, dude. Like, <laughs> I was waiting for this, and I got it, and it was absolutely worth waiting for you it was a feast it, I, it's such a feast <laughs> this whole sequence so i've just I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm i'm really excited to talk about it. <laughs> i got some dialogue here to go over because all the all the characters end up meeting up at a church at this point yes yeah so they've all been brought together Kyokai. Yeah. shion and, and junior's parties have reunited um alan says something really interesting here he says if cosmos oscillation pulse caused a countercurrent to flow through a dive unit it's not inconceivable. The one uh, we use are non-contact types after all. Mm. Now, I took that. Non-contact, I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Scare quotes. Because <laughs> what is a contact, right? Yes. Now, what they, I believe what she's saying is that um, like they, there was no physical connection. Therefore, why are we all sucked into this together? Yes. But the word contact, it might mean something else. Right. So he's trying to theorize how it is possible that all of them have been brought into the encephalon dive together. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it should be possible. Right. So that was his explanation of that. Xion responds by saying, it would still be impossible without some kind of powerful external force. Hmm. And then she has some sort of flash of Nephilim. Oh, of course. So she's like, even with what you're saying, Alan... That still wouldn't be possible without some really, really, yeah. really powerful external force. Boom. She sees Nephilim. There you go. So there's something with that. Something that's manipulating things, right? That's yes. kind of pushing things in a certain direction and an external kind of force. Right. I, my next note was chaos is a believer in the collective unconscious mm. because he says, I wonder if perhaps memories, in other words, events that occurred in the past, become stronger, more selective, and gain a higher priority when they resonate with others that share identical axes in time and space. That's a crazy sentence. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, you got to break that down for yes, a second. Yes, you do. But, but if you, if I you like understand it, that the core of what he's saying yes. is memories aren't, they don't just belong to one person. Right. And, and that, that some people share a, a deep memory, right? Yes. That's like core. Particularly when they come into the same axis of space and time, when they intersect... Yes. The, the collective unconscious is stronger. Yeah. I believe is what he's saying. So I'll read that again. I wonder if perhaps memories, in other words, events that occurred in the past, become stronger, more selective, and gain a higher priority when they resonate with others that share identical axes in time and space. If now, you, <laughs> sorry. Okay, you go. I, I just laughed at the next sentence. If you think about it in those terms, it isn't quite so odd that both my <laughs> memories and those of Alan are not reflected here 
<laughs> See, and that they're trying to explain. There's a little bit. There's a little bit of I know why they're doing this. They're explaining to us, the viewer, the player. They're explaining to us why only Junior and Shion's memories are represented here, right. and not anyone else's. If right. this, if this is just the memories of the past, how come we're seeing these and not these other ones? Well, and then Chaos gives a very, very great explanation, and then sure. it tells us why, uh, which should assuage our fears. The collective unconscious is stronger because these yeah. two characters have crossed an axis in time and space yeah. in which they share this memory. Right. And that's why we're seeing that and not uh, Ziggy's, for instance. Now, this is an ancient concept of the axis mundi, right? Yeah. Uh, the world axis upon which uh, things revolve. It creates a center, right? There's often wherever a, what you would call a theophany or some a manifestation of God, wherever that occurs, becomes something of an axis mundi. It's a place where heaven and earth can connect. Right. Yes. So most temples throughout time have right. been axis mundi, something yeah. like the, the Yggdrasil, the, the world tree of Norse mythology. That's the world axis through that tree. You can go up or down. You can then access, access the Y axis. Yes. Um, and so what he's saying is that, uh, through, if, if two people can share the same axis, they also have this access to the upper and lower worlds, right? Yes, that right. just the the pleroma. I say pleroma. This this game uses pleroma for that weird that, like um, that Margulis that asteroid base. Yeah, yeah. Where uh, yeah, the Margulis's <laughs> base or Utix base is currently. But when I say world. pleroma, I'm referencing the 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 completeness, the perfections of heaven. And so we have some interesting comments here from Aiden in Discord to, to add to this point. He says, um, it's like when Americans recall the 9-11 attacks. Yes. In a way. Uh, it, it's okay, so 9-11 became an unofficial center of, of the world. They yes. call it ground zero. Yes. Would they call it ground? Now, anything, anytime certain things happen, they'll say, oh, it's ground zero. Uh, the nuclear bomb strike uh, on Hiroshima, which I've been to, uh, there's that uh, office building that's still standing from right. the bomb because it was directly under it and it's just stripped. It's like broken forever and it's all, it's old. Um, but you, you know, you can say ground zero for something like that, but, but the idea of ground zero saying that this is the zero axis, everything goes out from this point, right? right? The, the important thing with the twin towers, I love that you brought that up because there are things that happen culturally to us now that we look back on and say, that was a center at all of my like all of my ideas of the culture formed around some kind of a center and it almost becomes mythological, right? Where we it's like, just talked about this yes. in a previous <laughs> podcast. I think it was an episode that was on Patreon exclusive for a while, but I'm sure it's gone on public now. I can't remember what we were talking about. Um, it was, I think it was, uh, uh, now I remember, I think it was just a Q and a towards yeah. the end of that podcast. Someone asked about, uh, our, our, what we thought about the nineties or something like that. Ah, yes. And, and we I mentioned nine 11 was that. the point where everything, right. everything just changed. changed the airports, yeah. everything just kind of changed at that point. Um, and that's true. And you, you can look at it as though the whole world is revolving around nine 11, at least the Western, the American world, yeah. you know, the culture kind of revolves around that moment. It was such a big moment. Um, and it's almost like things like that just happen sporadically that the world just kind of gravitates towards and says, this is the middle, this is ground zero and everything, it informs everything else beyond it, right? right. Um, and that can happen in a physical place. Um, but also like for the ancient Greeks, it was the Trojan War. That yes. was like, that was the moment that like their civilization just like became this flourishing thing and that they, they, they were able to you know, win the war. And even, even the people who identified as the, with the Trojans, what the Romans did, the Romans said, Oh, we're Trojans, right? Cause right. they were kind of counter with the Greeks a little bit. Yeah. And so they just kind of did it to antagonize the Greeks a touch, but they're like, Oh, I think, I think we're descendants of the Trojans. So it's like, even the Romans took something that's not part of their mythology and, and adopted it as their own center to craft their own world around, you right. know, just absolutely beautiful. Um, but yeah, this stuff happens even in our modern world. You can look at it that way. Yeah. There's always a moment and it usually has something to do with sacrifice. Yes. These sacrifices that happen in different points create something like a central axis around which a culture can build itself. Yes. It's just, it's just the wild. It blows my mind. I just can't, I can't get over it. Yeah. So when you, when you look at what chaos is referring to under this kind of lens, right? I think this is a great way of sort of breaking it down. The disaster at Old Milsha was a 9-11 like event, hmm. a, 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 a completely like society changing level event. The Gnosis yeah. came. Uh, yep. They lost the original Zohar. Um, second Milsha's government was, was 
developed after yep. this happened. It all came from that point. That point yeah. was that sort of event. And we have two characters, being Junior and Xion, who were right in the middle of that crisis. Hmm. They were right there right. when it was happening. You're right, you're right. And so that maybe that's the, okay, so that's the reason why their memories their share the memories access. Their memories are there you go. sharing the you access connected because it. Perfect. they were both there. Perfect, perfect. So when you think about it that that's way, it. that's what Chaos is talking about. This is why mm -hmm. we're seeing just their memories because they share that access in time. Yeah. And it was that type of sort of uh, event. That so was that was the... That ground breaking or, or, or yeah. shattering sort of event. Right. And that created the ground zero, the zero, 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 X, Y, Z axis. And yeah. then that was the, also that was the sacrifice, right? And the yeah. sacrifice founded the new world. Yeah. So, um, let's see, Aiden goes on to say, like it's a traumatic event or memory shared by a great number of people. Yep. He's got a, a that's here. the crucifixion of Christ. Yeah. Like that's the death of Christ and it founded, that's why we measure time from Christ's birth. Even today. Oh, sure. Yeah. We measure time from, oh, that's the point that everything changed. Right. They call it, even the people who don't adopt the uh, religious framework will say CE, like common era. Yep. It's still from the same, same thing. Point. <laughs> it's saying that once Christ was born, it ushered in a new era. Yeah. That's what that, that's what even the secular frame is saying. Like, okay, fair enough. But yeah. it's, uh, it, that's what we're saying. We're saying this is. Th this is the point around which everything then yeah. uh, organizes itself. Yeah. Old Milshow, the disaster the that, was it, that yeah. happened there was that. Yeah. So anyway. Also um, the Zohar, the Zohar itself probably has some way of being a, an Axis Mundi itself. Sure. Right. And so it makes sense that it's all located in that same place. So Ziggy says in this, uh, I think that the purpose of this dialogue is to try to help people confused by the very confusing terminology of chaos <laughs> to try to like break it down a little more simply. Ziggy says, so what you're saying is this world is constantly changing based on the experiences people share in time and space. And Junior says, a world made up of our past as glimpsed through uh, the mind of Cosmos. So it's their memories. But it's glimpsed. their access yeah. point. But it's through the perspective of Cosmos. Hmm, I see. So maybe you, you will learn more important truths through her perspective than maybe you would even through your own. Through your own, sure. I have trouble understanding how Cosmos is doing this. I know it's a game, it's sci-fi, whatever. Um, but I, I have trouble grasping this fully, but I love it. It's so cool. But like, I just, how is Cosmos doing this? Like, I just don't, I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot more left yeah. to learn about Cosmos. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait. Um, and, and Kevin and all sorts of things, so... Um, <clears throat> So they go into this church yeah. that they've arrived at. They find a Realian woman there. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alan asks if this is based on a memory uh, as well. Like, are we also right. seeing a memory from Xion here? Like, what's going on? Yeah, whose memory is this? And, and Xion does not respond. She says nothing. So. Well, she knows what's happening. She recognizes this woman. She recognizes first of who all. the Realian is. But she doesn't want to remember why she recognizes this she, person. Again, key. She yes. doesn't want to. And she this, doesn't want yeah. to visit this memory. And this line happened right before we walk into the church. It says, um, all of you must accept the entirety of your memories, right? Like yep. that's, once again, just hammering home. That This is what we're doing here. We're accepting our memories. Yep. The name of this realian is Fibronia. Now, I have a note Yes, to I, I got this Do one you too. have it? Because I do, I, have I it, do. I have it on a link, but if I will got do it. it. I've got, got it all. Free, don't you worry, man. I even have Kath and the other ones. Okay. Um, so Fibronia is uh, Stan... Or, well, that name is a reference to Febronia of Nisbis, the right. virgin martyr. Yes. This is very important to say that she was the virgin martyr because we're yes. going to meet other characters later on and they have that same mantra applied yep. to them. So we have, um, she was offered freedom if she would renounce the Christian faith and marry Lysimachus. Not a name I've ever said out loud before. She was tortured and then killed. Lysimachus then converted to Christianity after seeing how she right. suffered. Because she was, wasn't she supposed to be betrothed to him? Yes. And, uh, but, but they wanted her to renounce her Christian faith. And it was because her martyrdom that this, the son, the prince that she was betrothed to ended up like converting to Christianity yes. in the first place. It was exactly why, yeah. because, because she took her, her martyrdom was in the vein of Christ and, and she, she did it so gracefully that he was like, Christ must be real. So he converted to the Christian right. faith. So anyway, yeah. that's who they're talking about when they say Fabronia. Yeah. Also, uh, Momo says something. She says, she seems to be a realian, but there is something different about her. 
So I don't yes. know what that means. That's just Momo analyzing people just right. like she did with Junior saying, Doing yeah, the they're thing. almost clones, but there's something different. So yeah. basically Momo's saying she's unique. There's something special about this particular reunion. Right. So Shion is asked if she knows Fabronia and she sees a flashback. The, I was not that ready was for checked. this. <laughs> oh my gosh. This uh, is like um like Silent Hill or this is like Yeah. This well this yeah. is where the 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 horror, the cosmic horror vibes I was talking about, the tone yeah. really start to ramp up it to 11 shifts. at this point. You see the possibility of this game and of the story that's being told. You see where it can go. Yes. Even just like oh, it was like a half second like 10 frames yeah. of just like, boom, something freaky jacked happening. You don't even really get it. Yeah. And then it just moves on. And she, and it shows Shion again, and she's just horrified. Yeah. And she's not trying to recall this memory. It just happened to pop into her mind. And she's clearly, she's ushering it away. Yeah. She's like, no, no, not that, not that. Now, what would we know thus far about people who eat realians? Aha, they develop course. DME addiction. Right. Maybe... I mean, this is totally theory crafting on my part at this point, but maybe DME addiction carried to like the furthest extent it sort mm. of creates whatever these monsters are. Oh, you are. turn into something? Yeah. Mm, maybe that's that's what these uh, these people are, or these monsters are that are eating mm. Fibronia, this reality. I don't know. Yeah, because I didn't recognize them at all. No, they just look like monsters. Yeah. Oh, but anyway, just keeping a pin in that for now for myself, uh, maybe this is some sort of like advanced form of what DME addiction can do to you. Um, so Fabronia then asks Shion to follow her and Nephilim shows up again, uh, tells them that the instant they open the door that Fabronia has walked up to. So Fabronia yeah. is going to take them through a door. She says the instant that they go through that door, right, that they will come face to face with themselves. And she says it will be an experience full of, of sorrow, sorrow and, pain. and pain, but it is both to you and to us a very, very important experience. Alan says yeah. to this, uh, or sorry, I guess this is a scene later, but again, we're touching on this sort of like alchemical motif that, that we've been kind of hammering on at this point. They're going to have to go through <coughs> the Negretto process first, <coughs> yep. right? Which is yep. the facing the hard, the <clears throat> face hard the blackness. Truth. Yeah. The, it's going to burn. It's going to be yep. very uncomfortable. It's going to be, uh, it's going to hurt a lot. Yeah. To look yep. at this stuff, but it's necessary to go through that, that sort of like burning process to arrive at the albedo, which yeah. is second, which Where is then the you purified state. Polish. And yeah. then from there, you continue to true wisdom, <clears throat> which eventually leads to the rubetto. Yeah, the, the philosopher's stone, the individuated self. Right. right. So yeah. this is step one. We are yeah. we have arrived at step one, and they are going to have to freaking accept their right. pasts at this point. Um, right now, this is happening for Shion and Junior mostly. Right. But, but she it, but says all of you, right? She says all of you. Yeah. And we've talked about how Momo has that with some misconception of who her father <laughs> yep. was. Yep. Not sure she wants to accept what he really was. Right. We have this with Ziggy wanting to get away from his past. Um, I don't know so much about Alan because Alan is mostly ignored, <laughs> but I, I'm, huh. I'm going to guess he probably has something like this too. Yeah, I, um, I think so. So this is where it's going, right? Like the, the, the beginning of this process is, is coming about. Yeah. Um, so they go through the door and Alan says, but I know this, that line though, it's important to you and to us. And to us, yes. Like once again, like just like with Nephilim and Chaos saying, oh, it's important. Like we can't live without Shion. Like she's important to both of us. Yeah. Now we're getting some more of this. Like even beyond them, there's even more people who are like, it's not just important to you. It's an important experience for us as well. Yeah. And I don't know what that means other than to say that your experiences do go into a collective consciousness and that it's possible these beings are experiencing that collective consciousness as well. Yeah. And that you're literally, you're creating things as you're, as you experience things, you're creating new things. I don't know. Yeah. So the refinement of their character is beginning. Uh, so they go inside the door. Alan says, this is inside of the chief's soul. Yeah. Nephilim, it's like a hallway with blood. Yeah. Nephilim explains that what they're <laughs> seeing is the acute neurosis treatment facility. That's right. That's right. Yeah. This is the place where Shion's mother was hospitalized. Yeah. She sees uh, some zombie creatures kind of coming toward a single one. So there's one zombie creature in the center and a bunch of others are coming toward it. And they begin to sort of like oh, man. combine 
uh, like morph together, <laughs> sort of uh, me- merge into yeah. one being or something like that. I couldn't like get the best read on like what I was seeing. Well, I don't. But it was not really pleasant on for the one in the center. <laughs> yeah, the zombie in the center was they not kind of eat it. The they kind of just it's like a devouring. Well, they kind of stab it too. Like yeah, it's like, like yeah, messed up. And I don't know why. I don't know what's going on here. Um, but that's just crazy. Yeah. Um, golly, I don't want to get too far <clears throat> um, from the church because I still have a few notes on the church itself. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Um, because Nephilim is there. So as yeah, this right. as the Reallian is talking to us and we walk to the door, you look over and Nephilim is standing there. And then it's like, whoa, oh, like, okay, she's just with us the whole time, I guess. Um, but the church itself is fascinating. So there's, um, there are statues of a woman with a halo and three birds, presumably doves, around her. Then there's two angels on either side of her. Um, this would probably represent the other two girls uh, who we're going to meet a little bit later on. Um, before the woman... Before Febronia is an altar with one lit candle on it, a single lit candle. Um, well, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, there's a red square cloth atop the altar, and there's a small dish with like a black. There's like a thing on the dish. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is, um, but it's almost like. Um, okay, so the Eucharist, right? You have the Holy Eucharist, which is the communion, the sacrament, right? And the idea of the Eucharist is to eat the, you know, flesh and blood of, of Christ. Right. And the, there on this altar is an offering and there's something there in, in a cup. And it almost reminds me something along the lines of Jesus Christ in the garden of Gethsemane, where he says, um, I will take the bitter cup yeah. and drink. Yep. You know, glory be to the Father. He so it's almost as if uh, this is the moment if of it's, communion. It, he says almost. Uh, he says uh, if it's possible to take this. Yes, cup away, let this pass from me. That, that's my point. But if it's not, like, then I'll drink it. Because right? this alchemical process, it is at least in its Western form, it is very Christian, and it is very Christ centric. And you can look at it as that moment is Christ exploring, doing the same thing here sure. that they're doing, which is like, hey, you're going to confront. Not just your past, but the sins of the world, right? The entire and he's collective like, unconscious. Yes, the collective unconscious. Yes, he's he's taking on everybody's Everything. past all at once, right? and and he doesn't want to do it, right? Yeah, at least in some way. I don't know. Well, Other, if some it's Christians this may have some idea for on that. one character, Sheon, to face uh, their past. Yeah. Try the entire team. Try race. everybody, <laughs> and so there's just this offering. There's this offering on the altar, and it's almost as if you don't do anything with it. You just walk through the door. But walking through the door is the equivalent of drinking from the bitter cup. Yeah. Um, so there's, for all you Christians out there, there's a, <laughs> there's a fun reference there too, and a different way of looking at this, but that is, is explicitly, well, it's shown within the artwork of the game. Okay. Also, Shion was in an acute neurosis treatment facility. I th- And then it was like, yeah. you know this place well, Shion. I thought she was the patient. So mm. for a brief second, I was like... <gasps> I understand everything now. Shion is part of the life recycling act. Uh, and and then it's like, oh, her mother. Oh, dang it. Okay. I thought I, I thought I had come on to something and it was not. That would have been something. I, sure, I yeah. would not have seen that coming if that was it. <laughs> so it was her mom who was there. And yeah, the, the gnosis show up and start eating each other. And um, now we're getting a little more context from the dream that Junior had is what is my next note there. Yes. So, so at the same time that Shion is seeing this treatment facility and these zombies eating each other. Yeah, it's crazy. Junior's seeing something else. Yeah. So Junior is seeing Albedo laughing and talking about the song of He's Nephilim. He's talking about the song. Like, what the heck? And yes. it, it seems to, I, I would say the song of Nephilim seems to have driven Albedo unto madness, yes, right? That's Somehow. That's exactly what happened. And that's crazy. But he's yeah. just like, he's laughing. He's like the Joker. He's just like hysterically freaking out. And Anyways, then he says a line, which we're probably going to talk a lot about, I yes, think. Yes, <laughs> uh, this is um, what I've been preparing to talk about. For, like, <laughs> I figure, as soon as I heard it, I was now. like, oh gosh, <laughs> this is what Mike's was studying, because you were referencing genetics and yes, stuff. Yes, exactly. Now, so we're going to jump into it for sure. <clears throat> we are. Before that, real quick, um, Alberto um, says a, a brief line. He says, mirror, mirror on the wall, show me, define me. Yes. And I'm, I'm wondering if this has some reference to Jacques Lacan, who talked about the mirror stage, no. which is the, when you look yourself in the mirror and a baby, and, yeah, a baby recognizes themselves exactly. for the first time. The yeah. moment a baby sees, uh, looks in the mirror and says, that's me. 
right? And that's the point that's where a child... That's essentially the formation of the ego. Exactly. It's the formation of the exactly. ego. When you see yourself as an individual and yeah. separate from your mom, things around you. Nature. It's the, yes. it's the birth of the ego is, the, is this. And it's, it's almost like a lie, too. Because you look at the mirror and you say, oh, look at me. I'm a whole self. Yeah. And it's like, no, dude, you're a fractured like mess <laughs> and you need to put yourself into a hole to be yeah. a whole self. You need to, you know, rescue right. yourself from your, your monstrous self. Right. And, uh, but a baby will just be like, oh, it's me. I am a single whole and unique person. Um, anyways, it's, it's beautiful. And that's when you can understand movies. You can watch a movie and you'll put yourself in the shoes of the protagonist and it, whatever happens to the protagonist is as though it's happening to you. Right. right. And so here's Albedo asking a mirror to define him. Yes. And we have Lacan who um, talks about the mirror stage is when a child is defined by what they see in the mirror, right? It's almost as if there's a part of the child that is asking the mirror that same question and the mirror answers. You are whole, you are complete, and, but it's a lie. And that, the whole point is that it's more or less a lie, at least according to Lacan, because you yes. are broken and shattered, a shattered mirror into a thousand pieces or whatever. Yes, which was the entire motif of yeah. Xenogear's theme was the shattered mirror exactly. imagery. Right. And that's, anyways, ah, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so now you can okay. do this next so part. The, the, okay, so the, before I dive into the remainder of what he says here, yeah. I want to just simply comment on how good this dialogue is. It was great. Because Very poetic too. I think a lot of times games like to portray, or not even games, just stories, try to portray villains as really insane or psychotic mm, right. or whatever, and they, they'll just laugh. <laughs> and he was doing really that. Really crazy. And right. he's doing that, right? But it's not the laughing that's the problem. Exactly. exactly. It's the dialogue and the way it's <clears throat> written. Um being overstated it, it's going so far that it doesn't really portray a psychosis or, or, or a crazy um insane sort of villain in a way that feels convincing it's it's uh it becomes it feels cliche let's just put it that way right yeah it's hard to nail dialogue of a crazy person oh I remember my gosh yes that i was writing a script a long time ago yeah uh would have been when we were first writing scripts for movies we wanted to make back in probably 2009 or 10 or something Okay, like sure. That. And yes, I, yes. I, I wrote a, a little, little tiny short story of um, an interrogation with a character who's supposed to be like a clinically insane person. Mm, and I remember Parker sort of giving me notes on it and being like, you know, maybe with the right performance, this could come across as being convincing. I could see right. that. But like, there's something about this dialogue that's just not working. And mm. I, I, the only reason I bring that up is because it's not easy to write this. No. It's not no. easy to write dialogue that feels yeah. legitimately like a person experiencing some sort of psychotic episode, how they would speak, right? Yeah. This really worked. Like, yeah. I really felt Albedo's insanity. In yeah, this, yeah. Uh, the 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 driving unto madness mm -hmm. happening in the moment, right? So, mirror, mirror on the wall, show me, define me. I, I loved how you define wrapped that me. all into the Lacanian the concept there. Yes. And the voice acting is quite good. It's I actually really good. did look up for this part, I looked up the English voice. Vo yeah. it, it is really it's good. It's really good. It's so, I it's was really I was shocked. Really good. Yeah. Um, this was probably, I mean, there's so many moments in this whole sequence that just hit, but mm -hmm. like this one really hit. It was like, yeah, whoa, like that dude is intimidatingly crazy right now. Yes. This is scaring me to yeah. listen to. So the next part, I am the infinite telomerase. Telomerase, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I am not an anti-existence. I am the perfect chain. This yeah. is something that needs some explanation if you're yes. not if you haven't studied uh, <laughs> genetics before. Yeah. Not that I have in any sort of like real <laughs> academic capacity done so, right. but because I wanted to understand Xeno games, I have. Yeah, yeah. And so most people will, who recognize the term telomerase will know that it's a factor in uh, tumor growth. Cancer, And yeah. things of that yep. sort. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about that, of course, yeah. and why that is. Well, actually, but, I brought up telomeres and in yes, general in Metal that. Gear, in the Metal Gear Solid right. thing. Yeah, yeah. 
and how you can technically cure cancer. Yes. But then the DNA just unravels and then you just die quicker. Right. <laughs> so it's like not actually all that helpful. Right. So let's actually talk about what all that means <laughs> in depth rather than sort of like referencing it and hoping people will go look it up. So let's talk about telomerase first, like that term. Um, I'm going to be looking at my notes and kind of reading this just to make sure I don't get anything okay. wrong. I really wanted to make sure I did this accurately. <laughs> so biologists are going to just not, yeah, hopefully I'll, I'll get it right. <laughs> right. You're wrong. You're technically wrong on this. So one. it's a ribonucleoprotein. Okay. Uh, it's an enzyme that basically helps in the process of cell division. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mitosis. Yeah. Right. So telomeres, which what you were referring to yeah. in the other podcast, they're structures that are made from DNA and proteins that can be found at the ends of chromosomes. So yeah. when you when you look at a chromosome, the X shape, right? Yeah. Um, at the ends or the caps, I guess you could call it, at yeah. each of the four points. More or less. Uh, telomeres are basically uh, one analogy that a lot of people seem to like to use is that mm. of the, the, the caps of a shoelace. So ah, it keeps because it frays right. A yeah, shoelace the cap. would fray yeah. without the cap on the end of it to keep right. it, you know, together. And the, a similar concept with with chromosomes. Yeah, because DNA with the double helix, it's two strands that go around each other. Right, and they're just. I mean, they they fray too. Like they right. will slowly detach from each other at the right. ends. You know, it's which the same means thing. you would age and die really, really Sooner. fast yeah. without these telomeres keeping yeah. these things together. Now, in the process of cell division, uh, the telomeres get kind of grinded down yeah. over time. It's not a perfect cell division every time. No. And I'm going to explain why that is yeah, in a minute. Good, good. But the p important thing to know is that Telomeres basically slow the process of aging and dying. Yeah. They keep you alive longer, but over time, these t telomeres get grinded down, and that's essentially what aging looks like. Yeah. Right? The older you yeah. get, the shorter your telomeres are. The yeah, younger you yeah. are, the longer they are. Yep. The, so the, the caps of your shoelace get smaller and smaller and smaller the older you get. Yeah. And the reason you're getting older is because that is happening. So that's sort of like the basic concept that's the basic, yeah. to understand here, right? So let me yep. get back to my notes here. Um, let's see. Uh, so telomeres are required for cell division, but with each replication, telomeres get shorter until they are so short that they can no longer divide. And that yes. is when a yeah. cell, uh, there's like a, like a process, a, a trigger that happens where the cell is told to die now. Like, mm. don't try to replicate anymore. Uh, that we'd have no more telomere length you just die now. And so right. the, the cells die. That, so when the telomeres are too short for that process to continue, the cell dies. Um, <clears throat> when that happens, tissues age. Uncontrolled cell division, uh, or essentially overcoming the limitation of telomeres, right. is, is basically what happens when a cancerous tumor forms. Right, and so, this is done through telomerase, right? Uh, tel uh, uh, this enzyme, or telomerase, 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 telomerase. Uh, can help prolong the shortening of the, the telomeres. Yeah. It basically it like rebuilds them, right? Rebuilds it, yeah, right. But using there's a specific DNA sequence, it just kind of replicates it. It just kind of just keeps going. Yes, and it's meaningless, but it just gives you more length, right? So this was a really interesting stat that I was looking at. Up to 80% of human cancerous uh, tumors, or human cancers, express abnormally high telomerase levels. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's generally the cause yeah. of, of uh, cancerous tumors. Because uh, the cells refuse to die. Right. Right? The cells just, they, they technically could be immortal. Like, they'll just exist forever. Exactly. Because the telomerase will just keep repairing the telomeres, and then the cell will keep dividing forever as and, long as it yeah. has the resources like the the food the carbon you the know the energy the yeah. energy then it can just divide forever and you keep going and you would never age yeah right but it, it gets to um there's a balance <laughs> that needs to happen exactly. in order for that to happen and if it, if it gets yeah. co completely uncontrolled it just divides and grows to a point mm. where it's actually that it becomes a cancer it becomes cancer yeah. where you don't have enough telomerase the cell ages and dies if you have too much telomerase, it replicates far Forever. too much. yeah. And then uh, it actually betrays the body and devours it. So yeah. 
you need in order to find the fountain of youth, you'd have to have exactly yeah. the right amount of the enzyme in place. Which well, might I add briefly that one of the alchemists' big um, journeys in life was to find something akin to the fountain of life, right. the fountain of youth in Al particular. Alchemists, alchemists were looking for this. Wanted the fa fountain of youth uh, just as bad as they wanted the um, the stone, the philosopher's, the philosopher's stone. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways, little little more alchemy there for you. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, let me scroll up a little bit here. Uh, so, telomeres achieve the necessary balance between limiting cellular lifespan and keeping cancer growth at bay. Um, mm -hmm. So, when when Albedo says, "I am the perfect chain." Yes. Yeah. What I believe he's referring to here is uh, a nucleotide chain hmm. um, and the end replication problem. Okay. So let's I see. I see. talk about that. <laughs> okay. So each time a cell replicates, telomeres shorten. We've already yeah. talked about this. Kind of like a candlestick burning down. Sure. And when they get too short, they trigger a response that kills a cell. We've talked about that. Telomerase contains an RNA sequence that is used to reverse uh, transcriptase, which uses RNA to synthesize DNA. Uh, how do we explain this? Um, the double helix, right? You yeah. have the two sides, right? Yeah. Um, I just like with the zipper analogy. <laughs> yes. So in cell division, this is, they are literally being taken apart. The two yeah. are being they taken apart. Unzipped, zoop. Yeah. Um, one length is longer than the other one. And because they don't match, they can't like complete the chain. Hmm. And this is a problem. So when he's talking about the perfect chain, what telomerase does is it comes in with an RNA sequence that lengthens this one even further, but by doing so completes a sequence so that these chains can match up and the cell division nice. can actually occur. That's guy like that, yeah. That's the most <laughs> Basic way I can actually describe that without getting into super, super difficult, like, terminology. Sure. Telomerase contains the RNA sequence that helps complete a chain so that the cell division can happen. Without it, the telomere gets shortened. Right. Right? Yeah, invariably. Right. Because they're, they're just not quite the right length to complete the chain. Gotcha. So when he's talking about being the perfect chain, what he's talking about is in, in all of our DNA, none of our chains are perfect. That's why right. telomerase and the RNA sequence are necessary in order to even make the process possible. But with a perfect chain, you would essentially have the fountain of youth. You would have immortality. You yeah. would be the perfect being. Right. This is genetic terminology or a, a way of using genetic terminology to say essentially, I am the perfect being. I am invincible. I am yeah. perfect. Hmm. I am the fountain of youth, whatever you want to call right. it. Yeah, attain, the, attained it, yeah. He's attained it. He is the perfect being. That's what he's saying, I believe. Um, I agree. So, let's see. Let me get into more of the technical explanations now that I've done that really basic one. Uh, do, 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 do. Telomerase binds to the telomere overhang and elongates the DNA, then moves down and repeats the process, elongating, elongating the overhang, kind of like I was showing there. Mm. After that, another enzyme uh, called DNA polymerase is able to attach to this elongated overhang and copy the DNA strand that was elongated by the telomerase. If there were enough telomerase in our bodies, we wouldn't age at all, but we don't have enough of it to prevent telomeres from eventually shortening. So that's in cases where we don't have a cancer forming. Right, right? which is almost impossible, but yeah. So everybody well, it has is impossible. telomerase in them. Yes. You just don't have enough of it right. to keep you young forever. So yes. it, it takes decades and decades and decades for right. it to show and for you to eventually die, but it's because of telomerase that you can even live that long. Sure. Without yep. any of it, you would die a lot I would quicker. assume a lot quicker. Way, 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 <laughs> way faster. <laughs> if I have to guess, in the time that you explained uh, tel telomerase, <laughs> maybe I would have died. <laughs> mitosis has happened in your body probably a hundred million times, yeah. something like that. It's yeah. just wild. It's, it's happening all like the time. a billion times. Like it's it blows my mind to think of how often 
this process is playing out in your body. Yeah, it's Every crazy. second, it's just like millions of cells are, are dividing. RNA is being copied. Your DNA is being split and then reattached. And like these, the, the tips are fraying and everything is happening at every second in your body. Just like, just like that. And it's completely automatic. Crazy. You don't have to think about it. Your yes. Brain, you, yeah. It's just an automated It's an process. orchestra. Yeah. That is happening inside of you that your brain is controlling, but like you don't even think about it. Yep. It's just a symphony playing perfectly. Although every now and then in a perfect symphony, you'll get Melkor. Yeah. Who, who decides. And tries to change the direction of the music. He's like, <laughs> I am the symphony. Yeah. And he's, no, you're just a violinist. Like just, just play your violin. He's like, no, I am. I'm the symphony. I am. Yep, I do. I you. control. There is no conductor. And uh, then that's cancer, right? That's yeah. when cancer kind of shows up and just spreads. And Melkor, Melkor is cancer. Uh, read the Silmarillion. If you oh, yeah. Sorry. That's from the Silmarillion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so another note I put here, like, j- just to kind of show the other side of this, right? The other problem, not having enough telomerase. Too little telomerase can lead to big problems like bone marrow failure or idiopathic pulmonary uh, fibrosis, which is essentially like mm. scarring of the lungs, right? The disease where, where your, your lungs get scarred. Mm. Um, so they've, they've linked those things to not having enough okay. telomerase in the body. And this is sort of like- It's like happens. aging you faster. Yeah. Sure. And it, it's, it just has to be understood that there is a balance here. And this is what I yes. brought up in the Metal Gear Solid um, episodes um, is that like you can't just get rid of the telomeres. You you can't just get rid of the telomerase, right? Because then you just die faster. You can't just overload the body with tons of telomerase because then you just die of cancer. And like you, but but and there is some type of balance there. Um, but the more tel, 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 telomerase, I can't say that word. <laughs> the more telomerase you have in your body, the higher the likelihood is that some one of your cells will develop into cancer. Yes. yes. And so like. Th- th- that's that's the problem with cancer. If you want to understand why cancer can't be solved, like this is the problem, mm-hmm. and it's like we don't know do you, the right balance. The, we don't know the. Per- it has to be perfect. perfect. Like too little, you're going to age, and too much, you're going to die of cancer. Like there is, and it's it's just too hard to even control what's in your body first of all, but also to determine what the right amount would Should be. Anyways, be. it's probably different for everybody. Yeah, and so it's like, and even still, just given enough time, telomerase will. D- you, it will eventually develop into cancer. <laughs> like it just will. Yeah. And, and there's almost nothing that anyone can do about it. So, right. So let's go back and re-examine that line. Now that we have uh, talked about all of that, the line is, I am the mirror, infinite telomerase. Mirror okay. on the wall. Show me, define me. I am the infinite telomerase. I am mm. not an anti-existence. I am the perfect chain. Now, anti-existence is interesting. That's the one part of this we didn't talk about talk much. About, yeah. um, you know, you have the anti-type, right? So you have right. your archetype, but then you have your anti-type, which is like the correspondence, but also the complementary opposite to the, the archetype or the type or whatever. Uh, so then you have your existence, and then you have the anti-existence, right? Which is matter and antimatter, right? Where it's like they can't combine, but they both exist in equal amounts, something like that. And then um, he's saying he's not an anti-existence. Like he's, he's defying that label being put on him because that's easily what he could be. Like if he's the infinite telomerous, um, then he could, be an he could just be the anti-existence. <laughs> but he's saying that, no, but I'm not that. And that's why the, I am a per, the perfect chain comes after that. So he's yes. like, I am the infinite telomerous, but I'm not the anti-existence. I am the perfect chain. It's almost like if he said it that way, it would have made more sense. But I'm not saying they should have done it that way because the way he delivers the line is so beautiful. Really I wouldn't touch <laughs> it. I'd just make it yeah. worse. Um, but if you put the word but in there, but I'm not an anti-existence. Yes. Because... I am the infinite chain. And it's, ah, Well, man. the way ah, it's man. delivered also leads me to believe that maybe for a while, Albedo believed he was an anti-existence. Oh, I'm sure. Maybe he was told sure. that. Sure. Maybe he okay. ha- had that perception of himself. That's how he defined himself until he learned, no, I'm not an anti-existence. See, dad, I'm not. <laughs> well, right? that kind makes me kind of wonder then, are the URTVs? I don't know enough about them. Right. We don't know yet. Could it be said that a URTV is something an like an anti-existence? Sure. Now, I, I don't even know what I'm saying. That's, <laughs> that sentence doesn't even really make sense. But, but I'm sure in this game, yeah, yeah. I'm sure in this game they'll find a way to, to make it make sense. Yeah. Okay. 
So Ooh, that was good, though. That was a good go exclamation. Past the boss fight here, we got these purple swirls of energy, sort of overwhelming the party. It's similar to those that transformed Trankov into a Gnosis earlier. Remember, he was like swatting at them in the air. Yeah, yeah. These yep. purple things were before kind of he turned into, into. Yeah. So we see some more of that stuff. Um, then we come into uh, the vagrant story. Dude, you had the sequence. same note that I had. <laughs> <laughs> or Majora's Mask. Uh, or Majora's Mask. Like yeah, there. with. The skull Every kid. great JRPG <laughs> needs a sequence of a field with a single tree a in it. A single uh, solitary for, for tree. The, 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 uh, the pinnacle moment of the protagonist's, like, uh, what's the word? Uh, pathology. Yes, began yes. At that tree. At this tree. <laughs> and I love it because in Majora's Mask and in Vagrant Story and in this game, the tree, this area, symbolizes both the pure and the evil, like the good and the yeah. bad, right? And it like, ah, oh, it's it's too good, man. Yeah. I put this, Albedo seems to have turned into a Gnosis, and then we kill it, the Gnosis, and then it surrounds us, and then it goes into Shion's head, and now she's in Vagrant Story. <laughs> like, okay, this makes sense, this makes sense, yeah. this is fine. Oh, by the way, Green Leaves is playing in green the background. Sleeves. Yes. Green Sleeves, sorry. Green yeah. Sleeves, what so child good. is this? Is playing the, in the background. music that's playing in the background of this entire scene. Now, I did kind of want to bring up. Okay, so there's different ideas as to what Green Sleeves, um, the song is about. Yeah, the original version. It, it's yeah. not perfectly understood, and whoever wrote it uh, didn't yeah, really give much commentary some on debate it. Debate on it. Yeah, I yeah. Was reading about that. But some would say that Green Sleeves is reference to a prostitute um, who does work outdoors, and so her dress turns green from laying in the grass a lot. Um, but that is betrayed by one line in the song, where because it, it's about a woman who's rejecting the advances of a man, yeah. and the man is wanting to be with her, and she's saying no, and it's like, hey, she's probably not a prostitute, <laughs> if, if that's what's happening. So well, there, there's a lot of debate about what still, it means. There are still instances in which a prostitute could be not giving consent. You're right. You're right. So. You're right. It just the song doesn't explicitly say it, and that line seems to betray the idea. Just you know, sure. just at least subtly. Sure. So, anyways. Uh, I don't know why this song is playing. Um, maybe it's a reference to the Christian version. What yeah, child is what this? What child is this instead because of Green Sleeves? Clearly, these these girls are angels and and martyrs of the past. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Green Sleeves, uh, beautiful. So there's two white haired. Once again, white hair. How many characters mm. do we know with white hair? Chaos has white hair. Okay. Albedo. Anyways, Albedo has white hair. Okay, so Fabronia is sitting beneath a tree in the midst of a beautiful field of grass. There's two girls yeah. playing, running around the tree laughing, right? So Green Sleeves is playing. Cecily and Kathy. Cecily and Kathy. Do now, you have notes for who they are? No, I'll let you do okay. that. But I wanted to get the note on what Fabronia, not the Fabronia sitting by yeah, the Yeah, there's two Fabronias. The Fabronia yeah, yeah. with the party says. And this Fabronia is basically Nephilim, right? Um, like she kind of they, just becomes Nephilim at some point. I thought they were both there. Okay, so that could be the and case. Nephilim are separate. Okay, with I, them at the same time. I saw it a little differently, but that may you may be right. Very nice. Now we're also looking at two sisters, Cecily and Kath, as she'll go on to explain about running around this tree, around yep. Febronia in the center, which is and an illusion. It's not real. She's very much an alive Febronia, and things are very nice. Yes, in the in what we're seeing, yes. in the tree that's it's alive spring. It's and, springtime, yeah. which is signifies the the blossoming flowers and the growing plants and the life and the abundance, right? And then, like, some flash happens, and yes. Febronia says, this is all an illusion. This is what the reality, this is more akin to the reality. Yes. And all of a sudden, it's like fall or winter. The trees are dead. Everything's dead. The grass is uh, just dirt. <clears throat> There's gravestones everywhere. Just yep. dead people buried all over the ground. And uh, Febronia is not alive. She's de and decomposing. She's decomposing as the kids are still dancing. The kids are still running around. Yep. But it's like they don't know the truth. No, and they're living in an illusion, which is, again, calling back to not wanting to accept. Yes. Not wanting to look so at the even hard these angels. memory. They're pretending not it's not real. They're pre they're, yeah. they're living in a pretend reality. Yes. Um, and they're not facing their past or their trauma. Yes. Uh, they're not accepting it. So that's, again, just something to, to pay attention to. Yeah. Now, the, the Cecily and Kath, um, do you want to talk about I do. that note? I do. But first I have to bring up the Nietzschean concept because this game's all about that. The Nietzschean concept of something along the lines of um, like a, a God is dead kind of idea. Oh, sure. So there is 
Nietzsche in, I believe it's Thus Spake Zarathustra, he, he has this line, and that book's freaking insane, by the way. It's the craziest book I've ever read. Um, but it's not even, it's like a fiction that takes place 3,000 years ago. <laughs> like, yeah, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wild, and it's written in this archaic speech, and it's, it's, it's really cool. It's really cool, but it's just wild. Uh, but in that book is written, uh, God is dead, and uh, we'll never find enough blood to wash from our hands, and that uh, God's corpse um, is like a shadow on the wall that will continually be there um, as, until people realize that God is dead, right? So you, you take the allegory of Plato's cave, and it's like, okay, there's a shadow on the wall of a figure that looks like God, but is that God really alive? Is that God really functioning in the world? And well, we'll pretend it is, but at some point the cave people are going to figure out that that's just the animation of a corpse, that the God is actually dead. Right. Um, so these girls walking around thinking that their, I think it's older sister is the way they put it, thinking that Febronia is alive. Uh, and th you can live on that for a while. Nietzsche said, you can live on the corpse of a dead God for a while, but there's like a half-life to it. And you, it, when you approach the end, when society realizes God is dead, you're, like, you're, your society will end at some point around there. This is exactly what I was sort of hypothesizing with the patrons when we were watching the scene, it's like, I don't know if we're looking at an actual true event necessarily. Me neither. I think Me we're neither. looking it's at mythological. a metaphor. Yes, I agree. I think what we're seeing here is a metaphor for humanity. Yep, yep, yep. And the existence that humanity it's is Nietzsche. living. Yep, it's Nietzsche. Which would go back to the, the flashpoint moment in which they discovered the Zohar. They mm. are using the Zohar Ooh. and that Zo and the, 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 the image of reality as accepted by this current yeah. advanced civilization, which is all based around the Zohar, is an illusion. I think it's you're right about that. I think really you're right. really correct. Yes. And these two girls running around the, the dead Fabronia are a metaphor of sorts for humanity's belief that they have some sort of control over this yes. thing and that they can use it yes. and that it, it's within their power to have any sort of like control over it at all. But it's just a corpse. Yes. It's just a shadow of its former self. It is a dead God that they are yeah. dancing around thinking that they are controlling somehow yes. and it's not really what you're, they think it is. You're totally right. You're right. <laughs> and the idea, that's where the allegory of, of Plato's cave comes into it because that is the illusion. That's the illusory world, yeah. right? And you, you just don't realize that it's a corpse, but at, at some point you do. Um, and that's where Nietzsche says, no, you got to be the Ubermensch. You got to be the strong new man and um, rise above the, the need for such nonsense as, uh, you know, this is Nietzsche's words, of course, <laughs> as God and spirituality and all this stuff. And, um, and that is, that's Nietzsche's kind of entire philosophy. And as uh, you can see it in a nutshell right there. And this is just beautiful. I love the way that they it's so good. <laughs> can take Nietzsche in all of his flaws, all of his imperfection, all of his weirdness sure. and his like idiosyncratic behavior that is just like, just nonsensical. Um, he was an absolute genius and yeah. he saw into the future. He really did. Um, and once people realize that, you know, you're living on the body of a dead corpse, like people just kind of are going to do their own thing. Yeah. And that's not good for a society. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not unless there's a few people who can rise up and become the strong leaders. This is what Hitler thought he was. This is what, you know, a lot of the people, a lot of Nazis read Nietzsche because they were like, this is it. This is the new thing. You know, you know God is dead. We're the new gods and we can do what we want because there is no morality. Right. And all yeah. of that kind of stuff. No objective morality. No objective. And um, yeah. you, you see Nietzsche saw this and it's like they didn't read Nietzsche closely enough because he also predicted how awful they were going to be yeah. and how awful the communists were going to be and how the world was going to devolve from a religious unity into this absolute madness, this absolute bloodbath that was the 20th century. And that out of that, hopefully um, people can emerge stronger. Um, anyways, he was a huge critic of religion, but he was almost an even harsher critic of the absence of religion <laughs> right. in, in a, in a, in a way, you know? Yeah. So, well, and one thing crazy. I want to comment on, this is a little bit of a tangent. But, it is. I'm sorry. Um, no, not what you said, but what I'm about to say. Is, oh, both. Uh, but uh, what was it specifically that you said I wanted to respond to? I'm sorry. In regards to Nietzsche's flaws, I think is, is where ah, I would yes. go with this. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, people do this with Darwin a lot as well, where they'll like point to the pioneer of a certain 
philosophy or school of thought from the 1800s and they'll start picking it apart like yeah, yeah what they didn't see the, it's like yeah, yeah. you guys realize like this thought has evolved in the past <laughs> more than 100 years 150, right 150 this, yeah. this is not currently what people believe yes, yeah, now yeah. like the the, the the that that philosophy right. has been examined by yeah. people since then and that's <clears throat> it's no longer what we think so like darwin's thoughts on evolution right y- that's not the person to pick apart Talk to like current yeah, <laughs> evolutionary yes, exactly. biologists yeah. because they, a lot of things Darwin thought obviously are not what we think now. Right. So same thing with Nietzsche, right? Like obviously. Yes, good point. Uh, there, there are parts to the philosophy that, you know, but that, that thought has evolved past, you know, post his death. and It has, although I, in some ways I would still say that um, there at least hasn't been, the thought has evolved and the concepts, the philosophies have evolved. Um, but... I don't know that any of the people who came after Nietzsche, who adopted his ideas, approached his level of genius. Oh, uh, I still would say that certainly. he he's certainly. up there, dude. He's it, up it's, there. It's, it's, I mean, how much further would we be in these philosophies or schools of exactly. thought or our understanding of evolution yes. if Darwin could clone himself and continue thinking exactly. about it for there you go. 200 Good point. years? So if we had I mean, a Nietzsche clone... Well, gosh, I mean, he probably would have just destroyed the world now that I think about it. It's probably good that we didn't have a Nietzsche clone um, or, uh, you know, much less a thousand Nietzsche clones. Um, yeah, anywho. Geniuses of that caliber. Exactly. Continuing, the th- you know, we'd be further along is the point. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's okay, get to so the end of this sequence here. Let's do Cecily and Kathy. So um, they were both martyrs of early Christianity. St. Cecilia the Virgin virgin was killed for her faith in the third century. And then Kathy is probably for St. Catherine of Alexandria, who was also a virgin martyred in the fourth century. So we have three virgins here, right? So there's the main holy virgin I mentioned in the church. There's the one uh, woman in the center and then the two angels on the side. Then these, these other virgins. um, And I will use the word virgin because I think it's actually really important because you've got uh, Wagner Wagner's um, opera where he's got the Rhine maidens, right? And there's the three Rhine maidens, but they're nymphs. They're sea nymphs. They're, they're not strictly speaking real <laughs> and they're not virgins. And it's a, it's a different kind of situation with the Rhine maidens, right? And I feel like the three Rhine maidens are somewhat of an opposition to the three virgins, the three Christian virgin martyrs. Um, and that there's something of like a purity and a holiness that is to be attributed to these angelic figures um, that maybe we ought not attribute to the Rhine maidens um, being also three mythical women um, yeah. from Wagner's opera of the death of the gods, right? Once again, we see this idea of the death of God, like really coming up in multiple different ways and the idea of Ragnarok and all of this stuff, but it's, it's very clear in Wagner's opera. Yeah. And then we have, um, the three virgins I feel to, to kind of counter that a little bit. Yeah. Um, let's do some of the dialogue here. Let's examine kay. some of the dialogue. Uh, so Alan says that these girls look so happy running around the tree mm-hmm. and, uh, Fabronius says, would you say that if he saw this? And that's when the vision changes to the dead landscape with the girls running around the corpse of Fabronius. Yeah. And Fabronius says, this is just an illusion that traps them here. A binding spell created by mankind to control the Zohar. This is why I thought yes, specifically yes. it's a what metaphor for humanity. Believe that, yeah. that flashpoint moment of the Zohar being discovered yeah. in 2000 X or whatever it was. Um, at the very yeah. first scene you see in the game. Yes. That the beginning of mankind's illusion started there. Right. So it's like a technological um, leap, but it's like you're still living on the body of a dead God. Yes. And you have never acknowledged that. Right. Right. You still have this assumption of, you know, maybe objective morality or human rights or something like that. That's like, no, it, and, and you haven't gotten to the bottom of it and realized that it's, there's no actual foundation for those things. Right. The whole foundation of this galactic civilization is built on an illusion, I mm. think is what is being said here. I like that. I like that. A binding spell created by mankind to control the Zohar. But as far as they know, this world is reality. I want you to release my sisters, please, for the future of the realians as well. So she wants yeah. the party, Shion and co, to release her sisters. The ones from the illusion. dancing around this illusion. Now, this is another part where I'm like, is, are we really talking about uh, uh, two realians dancing around somewhere that we <laughs> right. need to like free from an illusion? Or are we talking about this as a metaphor of some kind for mankind being freed from the illusion of their society built around the Zohar? 
you have no concept of what the, rea- the re- reality of the situation yeah. actually is. Now, is it then a coincidence that realians, that uh, prefix, reality, like what yes. is real, what's not the real? But also right? alien. Yeah. It's got both. It's sure. got the, the reality and then alien, which more or less just means like outsider or foreigner or something yeah. like that. So like the outside reality. Yes. Right. The reality that's outside of wherever you are. Yes. And that's what you need to accept. And then her, her civilization has a hard time accepting the realian, the reality from the outside into their civilization. They can't accept the realians as yes. people. Anyways. Yeah. There's something there. I like something that. there. I like that. Good, good idea. Um, so I think this is Nephilim that steps in at this point. It says not just for realians, but for the future of humans, non-humans and all matter of living consciousness. Feb and I can only exist in this world of consciousness. We can only come into contact with the real world for a short time. That is why I called for all of you so that the future may be changed. So there's only so much that Febronia and Nephilim can do. Uh, Them being freed from the illusion and knowing what the real, what reality is. But they can't react they can't, or as I should say, interact with the real world for anything more than a brief amount of time. Now, we're talking about the, uh, she says, all matter of living consciousness. Yeah. And that's, we're talking that's, about the, the Gnostic. What a statement. The Gnostic separation of the pleroma and the spiritual from the physical. The physical, yeah. Right? Yeah. They cannot exist here in the physical for anything more than a brief amount of time because right. this is separate from their dimension. Are they gnosis of some kind? These Nephilim like and uh, Nephilim Fibronia. Fibronia, no, Fibronia was a realian that obviously right, that uh, <clears throat> um, Shion remembers from a past memory, but whatever yes. it is that's representing Fibronia in this vision what are they? It's got to be connected somehow to the, the monad, the way of existence, whatever I you would agree. Call it. They are here as sort of ambassadors for the will of mm, that higher being. Sure. And they are <clears throat> calling our party to be the ones in the physical realm who are of matter of living consciousness. Right. To do something about it. To this. take up the spirit, to be the body of the spirit, to embody yes. their, their will. Right. And enact, you know, physical change on earth um on earth sorry we're in a space <laughs> not in, on earth. In although maybe on earth reality. at some point um yeah uh, i also think that there's something to that there's something to the idea that um like the realians probably actually are conscious right they actually do have some self-awareness and consciousness and that may be what this is saying more or less like yeah fibronia fibronia was a realian but the idea that realians are just throw away nothing you like shells that don't have real you know, humanity to them or real consciousness or something is wrong because here's Fibronia as like an angel and her consciousness was manifest through her realian body. Yeah. And now her consciousness still exists and it now is channeled in different ways. Yeah. Um, but I think what they're setting up here is that realians aren't artificial. Yeah. Like they are, maybe they were made artificially in some physical way, but that they actually do have like a real consciousness to them. And so it's not such a strange thing that the realians are a manifest in this way. Aiden is also bringing up a great point here. Uh, Zeno, the, the prefix Zeno meaning foreign. Foreign, yes. Like realian, alien yeah. and Zeno are almost cognates. Like not cognates in the, uh, but synonyms. they're almost synonyms. That's yeah. the word. That's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're on to something with this. Right I now. think so. Um, okay. This was great because did you know, I actually didn't have Nietzsche in my notes at all. I know. For this, this whole section. This is what I'm talking <laughs> but about. But you people. brought up things and I was like, oh, Nietzsche, Th- that's this Nietzsche. This is what happens is <laughs> the notes are not what becomes the podcast. The notes are yeah. like the start, the launching point from which the podcast is born. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because it's and the then, conversation that knows? happens in response to exactly. points brought up. And that's where sometimes oh, confusion it. can come in. Oh, well, I didn't think about that. And so we got to go look it up in the database now and all that stuff I talked about last time. No, I love it. Anyway. We got a really, really good scene to break down here after I read what Aiden just said. Realians have human rights, but they did not always have them, of course. Yes. Oh, of course. Sure, sure. Um, and when I mention human rights, I'm more or less talking about the objective concept that oh, that yes. they exist absent some higher 
Anyways, it's they don't objective <laughs> morality <laughs> exactly, right. and Nietzsche's genealogy of morals kind of uh, does away with that. Just the concept in general. Um, no, I'm not. I, I also want to clarify one thing real quick. You don't necessarily agree with Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You said it perfectly. These are Nietzsche's thoughts, not necessarily so my own. When I read, when I read Nietzsche, I get this twinkle in my eye and this poetic, you know, oh Nietzsche, Nietzsche. But it's like, no, I don't actually. Like I'm, I'm this way with a lot of people. I read all sorts of people, like even like Dawkins and Harris and Pinker and even like, uh, like even Jung and Freud and Neumann and Campbell and all these people. And I'm like, I read them because they're so good, but I disagree with almost like three quarters of what they say, <laughs> but like, it's okay. Like it's yeah. okay. Yeah. And Nietzsche is like that for me. I, I read every other sentence. I'm just like, nah, but that's not it. But I just, but I recognize the brilliance. I'll just put yeah. it that way. I, I, I think that's important. Yes. It's important to encounter counter points of view that from people who are much smarter than you are. Exactly. But that do, you it's still a humility disagree thing. with because yes. it makes you examine uh, your own worldview and refine it. it, it to exactly. Through the alchemical process. It sharpens process. your perspective. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's how uh, your perspective broadens and how you arrive to a more complete sort of worldview of your own. Exactly, um, and, exactly. And, and it's important not to shun or try to silence those who disagree, with, particularly if they're smarter than you. <laughs> exactly. Definitely listen. Uh, yeah. and, and adopt the parts where they, where you think they've got it right, you know, right. And, and reject the parts where you don't think they've got it right. But it's important to, to be, uh, uh, exposed to it, to be exposed to those ideas. I agree. And, I totally agree. And, you know, not to be threatened by them, not to hide and run away from them, but to face those, those ideas that are painful. Yeah. Maybe. Or right. That, that right. would contradict and what you think. Yeah. That's well in keeping with the game. It's important to do so. Yes. I think. Okay. We see the vision of old Milsha being attacked by Cosmos. Uh, these streams of energy that sort of combine on the yeah. planet and this blast that comes out. And, and, and Nephilim says... Cosmos is there and yeah. does a blast back. Yes. I'm confused. Oh, we'll talk about so, this. So uh, what Nephilim says about this stream of energy coming from the planet is... That stream of energy is the consciousness known as Udu. Yeah, the red stream, right? The red yep. energy, yeah. Udu was the source of the space-time anomaly that engulfed Milsha 14 years ago. What you just saw was a vision of the future where Udu encounters Cosmos in the form in which she was meant to be. Udu yeah. will awaken soon. He feeds upon the consciousness of those who intend to awaken him. Oh, I've got good things as there. As well as those who wish to seek him. Uh, yes, please break that down for us. J well, it's, gosh, this is after the story of Cain and Abel where God talks to Cain and he's just like, sin is waiting at your doorstep, just waiting to own your life, basically. Yeah. And like, you have to be careful. Um, it, but it's always there. It's just there. It lurks. It's just waiting there. And and if you let it, it will just control you and consume you. Um, so... Okay, this is my first thing. My first thing here is a question, though. It's a question. Is, so this is in the future, but that was Milsha. So wherever right? Milsha is locked away, like we know that Milsha is not destroyed. Well, we got at this the point. cathedral ship. Mil Milsha went into some sort of gate okay. and it disappeared. Cool. But it's not Perfect. gone. Okay, okay, so okay. I would assume Perfect. Milsha is either brought back or Cosmos goes to wherever Milsha is. Okay, and in fights the, there. a different. In, in another layer of another dimension existence. or wherever it is. Need an like axis mundi to get taken. to a different yes. plane of existence. Uh, Cosmos, yeah. Cosmos could maybe use the Y data to access okay, of where Udu is. Yes. And there would be some kind of great Ragnarok-like event. Right. In which uh, Cosmos Go and Udu will meet each other in final okay. battle. All right. So <clears throat> that's just wild. Um, this is really good stuff. Cosmos has wings, by the way. So when she talks about this yeah. is Cosmos in her final form, yep. she didn't look all that crazy different to me. Just has wings. She just has wings. <laughs> <laughs> but she's an angel now and it's white wings and all that. That's good stuff. Um, I didn't notice her eye color though. Were you able to... Uh, was it blue in the scene? I, I feel like it was blue. I but don't remember. I, I could be wrong about that. I could be wrong. Everything about her is like bluish, right? And then the Udu is the red and notice Milcha, especially when... Um, when, what's his name, um, Mizrahi was uh, quoting the book of Revelation, um, standing atop that tower, um, that everything was red, 
right? There was just kind of a red cast to everything. And yeah. Udu is kind of that. I'm refining a little bit my interpretation of Junior's dream uh, when he falls into the red, uh, maybe less about the Philosopher's Stone and a little more about Udu, right? And I'm thinking, sure, okay, yeah. something like that's going on. But he definitely still resembles Rubedo and the Philosopher's Stone. But that dream, it may have been, it may have been yeah. saying something else. So Udu might have been that yeah. red plasma he falls into. Okay. Now, this is what I just love, and this is what you had just read. So, Udu feeds on the consciousness of those who intend to awaken him. And I wrote, I mean, that is how everything actually works. And I mean this technically. Angels and gods and the like. We think about them, we attend to them, and they become manifest in the world. Mm. Right? Like, there's this idea of the Egyptian gods, right? And in fact, I think Marvel made a movie similar to this. I Landon described it to me. I haven't seen it because I haven't watched a Marvel movie in years. But there's a movie about a guy who, like the Egyptian gods, kind of become he becomes a conduit for, um, like Horus or or Osiris or something like that. Is that- right? Um, I can't remember exactly what the movie was called. I haven't seen that. It one, came out just like a year or two ago. Feel it's pretty like new. I know what it is. Yeah. It's not but, a moon. Is that oh, the moon yes, writer? Oh, yes. It has about the moon. Yes, yes. Moon that's it. Character, I think Something with is, yeah. the word moon in the title. Yeah. Um, but um, the idea of that movie, which is more or less the idea that I'm kind of working out here, is that Horus or Osiris, they exist. They just can't do anything <laughs> unless somebody... And Does this is in their name. In their name, or somebody acts on their behalf. They, they're there, right? Like Zeus, the god Zeus exists and existed for the Greeks and didn't stop existing, right? But he is not embodied by anyone on earth anymore. And so he has no power. He can't do anything. This is but to whole, say that he doesn't exist anymore is, this is, is trope, wrong. This is a trope in a lot of things where the God's power is derived on belief. So like oh, the more belief or in Santa the world. Claus. Yeah. The yeah. more belief in the world. Santa Claus is a great example. Yes. yes the more Santa's belief perfect. in the world, then the more powerful the God is. And if people stop believing in the God, then the God has then no the more God power left. And, and Carl Jung talks about this. He talks about a dream he had, this crazy dream um, where he encounters this God, this great God who slowly begins to shrink in size and just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And Jung is like, what are you doing? And he, the God says, I'm dying. And Jung is like, you can't die. You're valuable. You're important. I don't want you to die. And the God says, well, what can you do to save me? And Jung is like, well, I can't do anything because he's just a person. He can't do anything. Um, but eventually Jung hits on this idea that, well, what, what if I tell your story? And then the God stops shrinking. The God becomes very small, but stops shrinking and says, if I can live on as myth, then I can live. And, and Jung is like, this is it. And Jung wakes up from this crazy dream and has this idea that like the gods contained in these myths are manifestations of the collective unconscious that are technically real in, in just a different sense that you're in used to thinking of the collective unconscious. It. Yes. In uh, the pleroma. In the pleroma, exactly. <laughs> the idea of it's real, the, 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 the spirit of it is real. It has an actual spirit. It just, it just can't do things. And this is also true even in Christianity, right? Like where Christ dies, he ascends, well, he is resurrected. He ascends up into heaven. But then he says, like Paul in his writing says that you are the body of Christ. Now, for as much as you are the yeah. body of Christ or which body you are, um, Paul talks about being the body of Christ, which is like Christ, he needs you to be his body. And the what would Jesus do means all of a sudden when you do whatever Jesus would do, then all of a sudden it's like Jesus did it, right? And that there, there's some way in which that's like, like, like a real kind of thing, because it's not just you, you're embodying the myth, you're embodying the, the person. It's not, it's not just you that you're right. acting out. You're acting out a spirit of, of a different being, right? And, and when a bunch of people do that together, they all kind of become one body. And that's actually the word corporation. The word corporation, oh, yeah. corp, corpse, like right? Like incorporate. Corp means body. And then uh, oration incorporate means to become one body. So when you're working at freaking, I don't know, Google or Facebook or whatever, you are part of a body that is all has the same goal and they're all doing the same thing. And there's like a spirit. There's like a God of Google that is like, <laughs> I demand more money and sacrifices of children. And then all of Google is just like, okay. They and then they just they do the thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can think of it that way. They're all participating in the same body together yeah. and that there's a spirit to that body. And that spirit doesn't exist without the body um, unless the body stops being the body and then the God loses the body, but the God doesn't disappear. The God's still there. Um, Anyway, so there you go. There's just like the mythological idea. And this is how, this is how, Ancient people saw the world more or sure, less, right? Yeah. Where it's like, oh, you're feeling angry. Oh, you got the spirit of Ares in you. You've got to, you've got to, you know, 
do this thing for this other spirit now. Now you have to, oh, you've got to embody more the spirit of Hera or something like that because Ares has got your heart. And it's like, yeah, that's just a different way of saying the exact same things that we say in our modern world. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, if we, if we take this to another step, it's if we're to believe in the collective unconscious, it's not just that the ancient people believed in it. We still believe in it now. Yes, it's I think so. It's a part of all of our myths. It's a part of all of our storytelling. It's That's Jung's of, point. Yeah. It's, a part of, uh, it's a part of our society and our morals and what we believe. And it's more or less derived from same concepts, just in different terms. Yeah. From a long time ago. I feel like that's the crux, the core of Jung's work. So when you talk about Udu feeds on the consciousness of those who intend to awaken him, right? Now it's like, okay, well, did the chicken come first or the egg? Don't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think about whether Udu came first or the people who thought about him coming first. That, that's not important. What's important is to understand this is how ancients thought of the world. And when you talk about Udu feeding on the conscious of those who intend to awaken him, some of this is just innate in humans. Like humans just have this desire to, to behave a certain way. And Udu is just there. He's just freaking there. Th that's more or less what I'm saying here. Right? So Udu gains this body. He gains this powerful, powerful body just by existing and kind of ensnaring people. These demons and these ideologies and these things want, they want a body. And I've, I've heard this explained as like demonic possession. And it's like, well, I don't know how, how else to explain it, sure. but there is some way in which like, you give your body to, to something else that's not you. You see it in group behavior all the time. So anyways, Udu is going to have that type of like existence and it's going to be, uh, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Seems to be the body of Udu in the physical realm. Oh, hey, there's a good connection. Yeah. How about that? Okay. That's what I would say. Margulis okay. and the... People of Utic seem to be because they seem to be the ones that want, as it said, um, anyone who wants to awaken Udu, it feeds on their consciousness, yes, right? And exactly. so they, I think, want to. That's awaken it, it seems to be what they want. Seems Perfect. Okay, <clears throat> let's wrap up this sequence and uh, okay. wrap up this episode. I like this line here: the, even the smallest of waves can spread through the universe and change everything. Yeah, so because they're saying what you're seeing is the future, but it's not fixed. The in or the deterministic, like what has to happen. Yeah, it's just a possible future, and you could maybe change it if you yes. want. That's the butterfly effect. Even the smallest changes can alter the course of history. Right. So Nephilim wants Shion to be a wave, like you're describing. Yeah. That changes the future where Cosmos and Uru collide. Yeah. Uh, before that, uh, she wanted the or before they're capable of doing that. The, she wants them to face their past. Yeah, like which that's apparently a necessary step. Apparently, they haven't done done yet. Still, I mean, they've started that. They process, started it. But what she says here is that they're, she's realized they're not quite ready yet. Right. Like she had hoped that this would be the moment in yeah. which they would face their past and that they would then be ready to be the wave that would change that future. But she can tell they're just not there yet. They're just not ready. They aren't willing yeah. yet to do it. They've been forced to, in this encephalon dive sequence, they've been forced to look at it, but they, they're not necessarily doing it of their own will yet. There, there's still some hesitancy, resistance from these characters to do that. So mm. um, she says that if they go to Milsha, where it all began, we're talking about old Milsha here. Right. Nephilim will explain why they've been chosen. Because Shion asks that. Why us? Like, right. why did you choose us? So if you, if you go back to where this all began, if you go back to Milsha, I will tell you why. Um, then we see a door frame, similar to the one Trankoff went through back in that whole sequence. Oh, Remember that? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. A very, the exact same type of thing. Door yeah. frame appears. Um, uh, they open it and go through, and we see an image of Cosmos being crucified. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that was crazy. It was really crazy. Okay. And a lot more effective than Choo Choo being crazy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more uh, visually effective. <laughs> Very much so. Very much than so. Choo Choo. Oh my gosh. Uh, this was great though. Um, so Cosmos is being crucified. Shion touches Cosmos and a light sort of engulfs her. Yeah, and she yeah. says the password that you guys picked up on earlier. Ye shall be Ye as shall gods. be as gods. That's the password in which they need and to the disarm the subconscious domain protection, Ooh. the AAA encryption sequence. That was it. In which they could then access the data that would uh, clear their name. Save them. So, ye shall be as gods was the password to get to the AAA encrypted data. 
Okay. Um, so, so this is where Cosmos awakens. Yeah. Good morning. And then she says, good morning, Cosmos. And uh, Alan hugs Oh, Shion. and good morning. That's the... That's what That's what she told... Um, what's his name? what she told Kevin. Kevin. Yeah, to, that she should say. Yeah. That, that he should say to Cosmos when exactly. she awakens. Exactly. Was good, just say good morning. Yeah. And and it's as though, it's as though, and this was a beautiful scene. I loved it because it's as though she's meeting Cosmos for the first time. Yeah. And that's yes. cool. So Cosmos has been here this whole time, but all of a sudden it's like, boom, uh, Shion and Cosmos just connected and Cosmos is unconscious has been unlocked at least to some degree. Cause I can't tell Cosmos still seems to act more or less like Cosmos, but there's like a newness here and, and Cosmos returns the favor back to Shion and says, good morning back to her as well. Yeah. And it's like, they're, it's like they're meeting for the first time. It's beautiful. It's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, okay, so they go to the bridge. They deliver the data to Lapis. Their names are cleared. Yeah. And, and they're allowed to, to leave at this point. So um, Lapis also means pencil, by the way. And I think black a black rock uh, has reference to graphite, just with the oh, pencil, sure. right? Yeah. Because uh, the word Lapis means pencil. But um, Let's stop there. I don't there. know if that's relevant. They, we can. They get out of the jam. They, they're no longer prisoners of uh, the Federation. Their names are cleared. Everything it happened is... pretty quickly. I mean, so it's, it's almost like, proof, oh, are man. you sure that it's nobody... Encryption. It is AAA, but it's like, <laughs> did nobody lose that disc on the way to Congress or something? Like, yeah. the way this happens in reality is... Um, A little more. You go to jail. Life. Like, you just... <laughs> you, the government wants to put you in jail. You you go to jail. You don't, yeah. you don't get to uh, do this thing. Even if you get the proof, it's like, oh, we lost it. Sorry. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> oh. What are you talking about? I haven't seen that. Who has it? What? Uh, well, Lapis. Uh, where is Lapis? Oh, I don't know where Lapis is. Oh, darn. So well, okay. I guess you go anyway. to jail forever. Anyway. Um, I also want to bring up just this one little touch. This was great. Um, when Cosmos is crucified, it's with wires. There's wires wrapping her arms. Um, and you even see, like, the caps of the wires, right? It's not... Well, it's not nails, first of all. It's also not chains or ropes. It's like technology. It's like the wires of the technological wires that are binding the unconscious of Cosmos that um, is she's held by the technology. Ah, that's more or less what I want to say. There's yeah. also a tomb in front of her or an altar. I can't tell. Yeah. Was it a yeah. tomb or an altar? I don't know. Yeah. But it's something like that. Okay. So it just so happens we wrapped up this episode. At a time in which we do have some time to oh, interact do we? with Oh, do we? Oh, please. Oh, uh, please. Maybe for about 15 minutes. Sure. Uh, we may only have Aiden here right now to to discuss with us. I don't know if anyone else is still watching because we've been streaming this for about <laughs> three hours. Three and a half hours now. <laughs> yeah. So it uh, could yeah. be. But it could be you. I'm looking at this camera. It could be you. If, if you, you support us on uh, Patreon at the $10 level or above, yes. if, the, if you see fit. Um, you can join us live for these podcasts in which in these instances in which the, the schedule aligns with Kaysen's need to get to a train. Um, we right. will uh, talk to you guys uh, live for a few minutes at the end of these podcasts. So uh, Spidey, Idris, glad I could make it to know one of these. Good to see TJ back. Weird Mammal. I have not seen Weird Mammal before. I think Weird Mammal's a new patron. Oh, nice. I get to watch one of these live. Uh, oh, yeah. Awesome. Congrats. I don't know if you stuck around, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, because it was really long. Okay, we have a comment here from Aiden saying, the emulators are Mizrahi's design. Yes. There are 12, one for each apostle. Marian Kind is the original Zohar. Okay, fair enough. Uh, it is also uniquely attributed with the turquoise The jewel. turquoise jewel. I wonder why they chose turquoise. Good question. Um, got a quote here. She is a captain. Well, so... Talking, I think, oh, about Lapis. Lapis's, a captain. Uh, okay, so TJ was right. Yeah, she's a captain within the Galaxy Federation's military uh, military special operations command intelligence unit. So she's a captain. Nice. Uh, in reference to Lapis, uh, Rap Lapis Roman from the wiki. Yeah. Um, uh, this is where people are talking about a way out. You know, I can't believe, based on what we're going through right now, which is so cool, I can't see how the sequel to this game isn't, like, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, like we said in the... Um, I just don't know how it's possible. Like we said in the first episode of the Development History episode, uh, there was no involvement writing-wise from Soria Saga. There's no involvement writing-wise from Tetsuya Takashi. Right. It was completely handed off to people who clearly did not yeah. understand the source material the from source, which they were exactly. supposed to be it's like they didn't, adapting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Which is and, fine. And That's that fine. is the reason why episode two, apparently, I have not played it. It is not me saying this. It's a lot of other Supposedly. people say it's not good. Um, but a lot of people back on the rails it. with three. And this is why I wish so much that that DS version of the game, episode one and two, which are in one game on the DS. Ah, uh, yes, they, I would they love They changed that. episode two yeah, story content in that version, yeah. and Tetsuya Takashi was involved in making those changes. <laughs> and that's what I want to play, episode two. I want to play ja- that learn version, Japanese. but there is no that's English it. version of it. Gotta learn Japanese. It's too hard. <laughs> I know, especially reading. It's like, yeah, good luck. See you it's in a it's years. almost the opposite problem for me in learning other languages, where where I can read it exactly the romance the way Roman. better than I can speak it, and yeah, I can yeah, speak yeah. it way better than I can understand it. <laughs> yeah, and in Japanese, the complete opposite is the truth. I can almost hear it better than I can speak it, <laughs> and I can speak it better, certainly better than I can fetch and read it. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, Talking about escape sequences. Yeah, we can see that. We can read that. Uh, <laughs> that tennis left the chat. <laughs> Thanks, In regards dude, to making you watch a 30 minute scene <laughs> if you die. <laughs> Uh, so Aiden is saying here, dream is an adequate way to put it. Or to put the encephalon dive or something. Yeah. yeah. Cosmos is such an advanced AI. It is pretty big deal. She has a subconscious domain. Mm, okay, sure. Okay. That's a good point. Do what is that the name of the title of that book? Do do something. Dream oh, of do a, do robots dream? Or is it robots? No, it's does do do something. Computers dream. dream? Do does AI dream? I don't know. The idea is does AI dream, but it's probably not that. I want to get it right. Do androids? Android. Do androids do it. androids dream of electric sheep? book that I must read. It's one I've been telling myself I was going to read for a long time. Uh, ah, the way... Okay, Dude Mackay has a killer one here. They found the same behavior in chickens, domestic chickens that have never seen or heard a hawk in their lives get spooked by hawk-shaped kites that ah. the researchers fly overhead. That is awesome. So chickens are afraid of hawks by yes, instinct. by instinct. And they don't even need to have ever seen one before they to an know. adult chicken to I know to be afraid. I stay away from that fetching thing. <laughs> because there's like a collective memory of hawks that lives yeah. within them. I love it. Ah, it's so cool. Uh, Aiden here is talking about how a lot of the mysteries surrounding this girl are not expounded upon until Xenosaga, a missing year. I think oh, that no. that's the anime. Are we, that are we going to do that? After episode two or something like oh, that. Oh, geez. Okay. Well, not now. I know. Maybe eventually in preparation. For I thought we were just three. playing three games, but it's like we're going to have to do all extra stuff too. <laughs> I think in Which the, same way, in the same way that we do preparation in like development history before we do these, ah, we'll probably we do to do a similar okay. level of preparation, not in development history since we already did that, but just in watching the anime, looking at the, well, um, the little short story that Soria Saga wrote. I forget yes. the name of it. Um, and the, hmm. that, that game that is like lost forever on those old Japanese cell phones. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And possibly like looking into whatever changes happened in episode two on the DS version, things of that nature, right? Okay. We'll probably just need to look into those before we do episode three of Xenosaga. Um, the small flash game, which took place between Xenosaga two and Xenosaga three is a missing year. So it's not an anime. It's a, a game. Nephilim, I mean. So the, the mysteries of Nephilim will not be expounded upon until this is, you know, saga, a missing year, I guess. Okay. Um, I don't want to say too much for risk of spoilers. And if I'm saying too much, please let me know. However, I think it is a good mentality, uh, good to mentally prepare for the disjointedness of the story. Okay. Maximum All right. in chaos. Okay. Cause when we started the second episode, I think I already read all this stuff. That's ah, uh, yeah. Um, didn't have to okay. work. Okay. Okay. Ash is here. I played the game many times and I still don't get most of it. Thanks for making some sense into this madness. We're trying. Ash. At least. Okay. So what's so <laughs> funny is that this is probably the most confusing part of the game for most people. Yeah. Yet this is the part because we played Xenogears, because we've researched things, because right. we're like diving into it and it at least presented us with stuff that we can know instead of just hints at some mysterious future. Right. This is probably the part that we nailed the most. <laughs> or that I we think so. Got the best. I think so. Uh, so to that to that extent, yeah, congrats. But yeah, um, I mean, we don't really know where this game's going. It is the most important part to 
understand, I think. I think so. In terms so. of like the, the, the intention of our podcast, which is not to uh, just regurgitate the events and lore of Xenosaga to you, the viewer. Exactly. It is to try to not understand what the story is trying to say. Like deeper. What is the yeah. point? What is it? I mean, we have that quote from Tatsuya Takahashi back from Xenogears saying that if I tried to talk about this with young people, like no one would listen to me. Yeah. So my way of like expounding on these ideas and my thoughts on these ideas is to make a little JRPG about it that, yeah. you, you know, a, a gift... Um, <laughs> gift wrap the concepts, yeah. the psychological concepts, the um, philosophical concepts right. within a mecha anime video game <laughs> so that it's, kids okay. can get excited about Do you know the what that part. is? This is biblical once again. This is Old Testament stuff. But biblical, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a coat of skins, right? Sure. It's a coat of skins. It's a, it's a, like what God gave Adam and Eve after they left the garden. It's yeah. like, hey, you're valuable. You're going out into this world. Here's some protection so that the thorns and thistles won't just like do you in right away. And yeah. so it's like Takahashi has this gem, this beautiful thing he wants to present, but no one wants it. It, it yes. just is met with harshness. Pearl so he swan, wraps dude. it in, in this coat of skins, this beautiful coat of skins, yep. and he mythologizes it into this beautiful story. And then he can deliver the same valuable pearl mm. to people that they never would have gotten on their own, you know? True. Uh, that's fascinating. I love that. That's awesome. So yeah, um, that that's essentially like his his whole reason for doing these Xeno stories in the first place. Right. He, and he'd I, been even, studying all this stuff with his <laughs> wife and talking about it. It's like, dude, people need to be talking about this. People, I think so, even kids now, especially need now. need to be thinking about this. Oh, totally. How do I make kids think about it? Let's dress it up like a mecha anime. Yep. Then they'll hopefully start trying to understand what the freak I mean when I say I'm the infinite telomerase <laughs> and <laughs> stuff like that. And <laughs> what's so great, I didn't care. I like, I love this stuff now. I just live for this kind of content. This is right up my alley. It's awesome. But when I was a teenager, I didn't freaking care. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Even t like 10 years ago, I didn't really care that much about this. Yeah. Like I mentioned that I had learned all, uh, not all, but a lot about Carl Jung in, in film school sure. back at college 10 years ago. And like, yeah, I knew Jung. I knew his concepts. I knew st I could I could um like get a pretty good grade on a test, right? Yeah. But like I didn't really know what he was actually talking about. That yeah. came more recently and uh especially with as we played Xenogears. Like mm -hmm. that's where like I had this understanding, actually probably a few years before that, uh, but I had this understanding of Jung, but Xenogears really helped it flourish. And that's when I really actually read like almost all of like his books. Like Carl's books. Yeah. yeah. Instead of just like hearing lectures online or thinking about him or hearing people talk about him, I actually read him and I discovered a whole new Jung than I had ever been exposed to before. Yeah. And that's really, that is thanks to Takahashi. It so, is. Yeah. It worked. I'm 36, it but worked. like, thanks. <laughs> I saw I saw the robot on the little package, and I was like, that looks sick. And then all of a sudden, I'm like reading Ion. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> like, what the fetch? Oh, and that's a great book. So anyway, I don't know what okay, point I was going on with that, but uh, uh, but that is the reason that we're doing the yeah. podcast, right? The, the reason yeah. we're doing this podcast is not to be absolutely accurate in stating... Is that a 100 series reality on the ship? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, We're not it's, the lore it's for masters. for this encephalon dive sequence and making yeah. sense of this absolutely wild sequence. Like, what are they actually talking yeah. about? The, the unfortunate thing is I probably confused more people with my talk of angels and gods and demons. But, <laughs> you know, talk to me more if you want to learn more about that. I've got it all fleshed out in my head. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we'll take this last one from Dude McGuire and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Doom guy says, Mike, when this second episode, so we recorded two episodes tonight, when the second episode goes live, it will have been about four years since the rebranding to Resonant Arc. Oh, no Happy way. Happy Resonant Anniversary. It's That's like November, crazy. huh? So it'll be November, November of 2018. I guess. Sure. Has it really been four years? Well. That feels crazy So my daughter was, my daughter's five. So yeah, that's I think, wild. Dude. I think that's right. So it was about a year later because when my daughter was born, Landon was still doing the podcast. Right. But then um, it wasn't too long after that that he left, we, and then we kind of we switched it. Yeah. Wow! Wow! Freaking wow! Thank you for reminding us how long we've been doing this. <laughs> well, the, we've been doing this longer than that. That was Seriously, just the rebrand. <laughs> that's just the most recent chapter of this freaking yeah. YouTube this saga journey that we've been on for yeah. at least ten. 
since 2012, I think, or 2011. It was actually. at the very end of 2011. I think we did yeah. that first video for your class. Yes, that with Devin Graham somehow oh, got views, and I don't know how. And then we did uh, the <laughs> Lazy Jedi, the Lazy Jedi, that. and it just took off from there. But yeah. oh my gosh, um, yeah, that was 2011. So it's been 11 years, almost to the day. Then that is crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. That's wild. That's wild. Anyway, can't believe it. Too many guys saying one more thing. I'll read that, and then we'll we'll sign off. But we appreciate you. Yes, thank you, you all of our patrons um, and who's supporting the channel. Yeah. Um, there's a video we love I, I just released today. Yeah, as I of saw the that. Time of recording this, my um, impressions on Tactics Ogre, which is a game that I'm certain we will cover the, on this podcast at some point. The story's really, really interesting so far. Cool, good. Um, anyway, somebody commented said, "Finally, a video that's not a podcast." <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sorry. It's just, I'm not I, it's because just how it is. I think. Well, it's a hard ask. It's a really hard yeah. ask to get someone who may not necessarily be interested in listening to like a two hour, well, if you think about the whole series, I mean, dozens, ton, dozens and dozens of hours of analyses, right? It's like pe some people don't have time for that. Um, it's, a, it's a hard ask to, 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 to have people accept that that's our main content now. But hmm. I, I, I think it's actually, for those who are giving it a shot, I think it's actually far more profound, deeper, I think more so. meaningful content I think than so. what we were doing before. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I uh, we will be getting back to more of the uh, uh, what short form. the sh the shorter form. I say short. It's not that short. It's like twelve minutes or whatever. <laughs> the, the the video essay content. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm I'm in the works again with an editor. I've talked about this. I, I got derailed for a couple months, but uh, the Final Fantasy retrospectives are oh, getting cool. back on track. Um, a lot of work has been done on them. I just haven't been talking about it because every time I talk mm. about it, there's some other wrench that gets thrown into it and then it <laughs> takes several more months to get back on track yeah. again. But it's back on track. And uh, the first episode should be coming out pretty soon. So um, more of that will return, uh, specifically now that we have this and we don't have to edit videos, the podcast videos, quite so long yeah. as we used yeah, to. It's helped so much. It, 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 it takes a lot less time to yeah. get this done. So um, anyway, it, it's thanks to our patrons. So thank you for supporting us yeah, thank um, you. and for helping us to continue to, to grow what we can do. And for everyone that's watching this on YouTube, um, we never, never ask for this, but uh, please like are the videos. <laughs> yeah, we don't <laughs> and do that, subscribe do and comment and all of the things. We probably should. We, sh we don't want to do it. <laughs> we it's don't like I doing don't, this. I don't want to accept that it works. I know. Because I hate. But it does work. That it works. Like the uh, fact yeah. that I have to tell you, hey, like and subscribe. Smash that, that gets like people button. to actually do it. It I makes know. me feel bad. It makes me feel like I'm like, I don't want to tell you what to do, dude. Just like, if you <laughs> like it, then like it. I'm not going to tell right. you to like it. Yeah, yeah. But for some reason, telling people to like the video actually gets them to like the video. And I and hate it means that a lot. It means a lot to us though. It really it does. does. It does. And, so, and, and, and it's, it makes it, it makes our video favorable to, to being shown yeah, to more people. The algorithms and all that. Yeah. So if you don't you know, have the means to support us on Patreon, I mean, even just liking the video, it, it helps. So, you know, like, feel free to do that. I'm not going to tell you to do it. Feel free to do it if you want to. But just bringing it up just reminds people, oh, yeah, I'm like, you know, if you're even watching after two hours. <laughs> so, hey, some of our Xenogear stuff was three hours. Yeah, some of it was four. I think the last episode was the four. Last, yeah, it was like, something. yeah, it was freaking tons. Uh, okay, so Dude right. guy says, yeah, Dark Pixel has evolved. Video went up November 5th, 2018. So that was the day. November mm -hmm. 5th. So we're coming up on the... November 5th. On the 4th anniversary. And then Ash says, being reminded to like the video really does help. And I, it's true. There's yeah. tons of videos that I will watch every day that I don't click like for because I just don't think of it, you know? Yeah. Uh, anyway, thanks everybody. We're going to log off now. All right. Um, I think we will have around two more episodes of Xeno Saga left before we get to the ending. So look forward to that. And we'll see you next week. Peace out.